1 Corinthians 13. We, we turned there, we started preaching out of 1 Corinthians 13 last week. And we're going to continue for several weeks. I think I said three, but I don't, that's probably not totally accurate. Probably at least four, maybe five weeks. But 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter in the Bible. And so we're going to, we're going to slow down a little bit um, and preach maybe four weeks. Uh, well, probably for sure four weeks and maybe five weeks. Um, so we'll, we'll be here for the next five weeks or so. Look at verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, and that word charity is love, I have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. I am nothing. Pretty powerful statements being made here. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, notice I give everything. Sell everything, give it all away, and even my own body I give as a sacrifice for others. And have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Then verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. God begins right here with about 15 different words that He uses or phrases that He uses to describe love, to describe His love. And it's not just only His love for us, but it's His love. It's, it's the love with which He wants us to learn and possess in order to love one another. To love Him and to love one another. So it's, it's a great, great chapter here. And today we're going to start to look at the definition here in verse 4. We're going, to, we're going to start looking at these 15 different points on how... We're not going to cover them all today. But, uh, but how God defines agape love. His love. Let's pray. Father, I do pray now that you would bless our service. I pray that you would have great plans for this sermon and, and, and for the Holy Spirit to work in, in our lives and in our hearts and our minds here this morning in this service, that we, might, that we might be challenged, that we might be changed, that we might leave here different, different than it was when we came. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to read for you a, an illustration about love. There was a very unusual military funeral in California in December of 2013. Sergeant First Class Joseph Gant, who fought in both World War II and the Korean War, was laid to rest. He had been captured in Korea in 1950 and died the following year, 1951. But his body was not returned for many years, and his death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. His wife, Clara, waited for decades for her husband to come back. She regularly went to the meetings with government officials seeking information about what had happened. Clara even bought a house and had it professionally landscaped, so all Joseph would have to do when he came home was go fishing. She was 94 years old when his remains were finally brought home for a military funeral with full honors. It wasn't the homecoming she dreamed of, but she finally knew his fate. Clara told a reporter who interviewed her, He told me if anything happened to him, he wanted me to remarry. And I told him, No, no. Uh, here I am, still his wife, and I'm going to remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. That's love. That's love. And I'm, not, and I'm not saying it's wrong to get remarried. Not whatsoever. I don't, I don't think that's true. But, but for this lady, she said, He was my one and only. And, and then that's it. And I'm just going to prepare for Him to come home or until I get different information. That's love. But God's love, look, makes this type of love pale. 
I mean, this is the love that she had for her soulmate, as we would say. And we're going to take a look at God's love. We're going to begin. We're going to begin, and, and over the next couple of weeks, take a look at, at His love. God says, just to review quickly from last week, God says, if you have great uh, uh, spiritual gifts, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, uh, the gift of knowledge, and if you have, uh, and or you have all the faith in the world. He says, God says, you have all faith. So much so that you can look to a mountain and say, I want you to move from right there and I want you to go over and move, be moved over here. And you can accomplish that. God says you have a, a great, powerful spiritual gifts provided to you by the Holy Spirit. And God says, and if you sacrifice, if you're the greatest philanthropist that's ever, that has ever graced this earth, and you have everything, and you sell everything, and you give it all away, and then even in the end you say, that's not enough, I'm going to die. I'm going to put my life on the line, and I'm going to die as a sacrifice. God says, if you have these type of powerful spiritual gifts and abilities and talents, but you don't have God's love, you're nothing. We're nothing. Useless. Not me. God says that. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. And God's telling Paul what to write to them. So we're going to take a look, beginning today, at this thing that God says agape love. This thing called agape love. Today's, the title of today's sermon is The Essence of of love, the essence of love. If we can begin as the children of God, if we can begin to possess God's love, it will change our lives. And it will change the lives and people around us. It will change communities around us as they get a clear view of what God's love really is. I will admit, Studying this, hammering this out during the week, is having an effect on me. It's having, a, it's having an effect on me. And I pray that it would have uh, an effect on you. Point number one, love suffereth long. It is long suffering, the Bible says. And these two words come, a Greek, come from a Greek word that means to be patient. Uh, it means patient, restraint, of a strong swelling of emotions toward anger. It means you feel anger building up and swelling up in you, and, and, and for a long time this continues. And God says when you're long-suffering, it is restraining that emotion and just tamping it down and just saying, it's not happening. It's, it's not happening. Agape love that we talk about and that God, and that's the word for charity here. Charity means love and that type of love is called agape. It is, a, it is, it is willing to, to patiently wait a long time for someone to come around, for someone to make progress, for so someone to turn around. How many of you have people in your minds, a relationship, could, it could be a spouse, it could be a child, it could be a sibling, it could be a cousin, it could be a friend. But you, but you have a relationship that is stressed and strained now, and, 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 and at times you feel anger because you want to look at that person and say, when are you going to come around? When are you going to turn around? When are you going to get with it? We, we, all, we all experience relationships like that. There's nobody in this room that doesn't. But God says that the kind of love I'm talking about stays involved and doesn't give up. He keeps praying. It keeps loving. It keeps communicating. It keeps reaching out to that person or those people, whatever the case is. Reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. Even when the person says, I'm not listening, God's love. Can't. Look, God, thank God that he, didn't, that he didn't turn me away the first time I rejected him. The pastor set me down in Gilgrove Baptist Church in a pew in this section right here 
on the front row. Nobody else was in there. And he witnessed to me, point blank. And I said, no. At the end, I just said, and and look, why? (laughs) Why? Why? I look back now and think, what in the world could have been going through my mind? I had no reason. If he would have said, why, why won't you? He didn't. If he would have said, why? No, he did. And I said, well, I'm just not ready yet. I'm not, ready to, I'm not ready to make sure that I go to heaven someday yet. That's crazy thinking, but, it, but that was the answer I gave him. God never gave up on me and kept after me and kept after me and kept after me till on November 4th, 1979, I walked an aisle. It would have been a lot easier on me stress-wise if I had gotten saved that day right there with nobody else in the church, in the church uh, building. But I didn't. But a year or so ago later, no, it wasn't that long. But a little bit later, uh, I walked the aisle, sitting right back there, three quarters of the way back, walked that aisle, came down and and got saved. And thank God that He is long-suffering, people, regarding our salvation, regarding us as His children, as believers, as born-again believers, He is long-suffering toward us. How many times do you disappoint God? <laughs> yeah, Nate, Nate's down here. Can't even count that high. And that's just today. No, really. I can't count that high. And God says, I'm going to stick with you, though. I'm going to stick with you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to keep approaching you. I'm going to keep calling you to me. I'm going to keep calling you into my presence. I'm going to keep through my spirit that indwells the believer. I'm going to keep reminding you to get into the work of the Word of God today. To spend some time in prayer today. To be to, to look to just get with me and just talk with me. That's what we're talking about. We read His Word. He talks to us through His Word. And we pray back to Him and talk to Him through prayer. God says, I just want to talk with you and I'm not going to give up. And we may neglect him today. And he says, when you wake up in the morning, I'm going to be right there. And we may neglect him tomorrow, but on Tuesday morning, he says, when you wake up, I'm going to be right there. Long suffering. And God says, I'm bragging on God right now, but God says this is agape love. And it's the type of love that I want you to have one for another. I want you to love each other that way. Long suffering. Long-suffering. First world problems. As Americans, we often are easily frustrated with what we call first world problems. Here's a few examples. When you say something on social media which you think is really clever, but hardly anyone likes it. That frustrates people sometimes. That's their big problem for the day. First world problems. When your kids put dishes in the dishwater before they unload it, now you don't don't know which one's clean necessarily from which ones that aren't. When you run out of hot water for the shower because someone else took too long. Yeah, I know about that one. I got got four women and five if you can include the dog living in my house with me. When you, run, uh, uh, when you and your spouse can't agree on what temperature to keep the thermostat at. These are things that frustrate us. These are things that sometimes cause arguments. And if the argument gets opened up, God knows where that goes. Then all of a sudden you're saying things to each other. Not that my wife and I have ever done this. But you're saying things to each other that have nothing to do with the original point. Like I've been wanting to say this stuff anyway. First world problems, folks. Never forget that picture that I saw, on, I think that's on Facebook, about the people that were sitting in that block church, no windows, no doors, just block, and it was water up to their knees, and they were meeting for church. Now that's people that have struggles, not us. We have these first world problems, if you will. When your battery, when your phone battery dies before you get home from work to charge it, 
frustrating. <laughs> when you're eating chips, crunching so loudly that you can't hear the TV. Horrible suffering. When you get chicken tenders from the drive-thru, but they forget the dip in sauce. What's the matter with them people? <laughs> I know we have... I know we have deeper problems than that, but, but these are things that do frustrate us. Why? We're spoiled. I've been saying it a long time here. We're spoiled Americans. Most of us, for most of us, the worst discomforts, sufferings that we face each week are very trivial. For most of us. There are people in this room that are going through some, through some tough times, and I know that. And we all go through hardship, and, and I'm teaching about that on Wednesday nights. So you know, I'm not trying to make a light of that. But a lot of times, the least little thing knocks us off of our spot. Causes us to snipe at each other, or snipe at our spouse, kids. We, it makes us hard. Look, when we get frustrated by these kind of things, it makes us hard to understand, to relate that all that Jesus did when He came to this earth and suffered on the cross. It makes us hard to understand the long-suffering of a God toward us. But that's exactly the way that, that, God, that God wants us to respond to one another is long-suffering. Not, not over this trivial stuff. Although, the trivial things can, can be used to help us to acclimate our spirit and to yield to God. Driving down the road and somebody cuts you off or driving down the road and you need to get over where well, you put your blinker on and nobody lets you over and you get frustrated. Never mind that you never, never let anybody else in. I used to never let anybody in. That's why I bring that up. But I do now. A couple of years ago, I just said, I'm going to stop being that way. And I tend to, and I think, I think I can say, I think that I can say that ever since I made that decision, I've always let somebody in to put their blinker on. Well, the other day, I'm driving home from somewhere, and, um, and I put my blinker on. I got caught in this short lane. It's going to turn. I didn't see it. It was north side of Richmond. And I wanted to get over and man, them car, as soon as I turn my blinkers on, it's like, uh-uh, buddy. And I, and I remember sitting there thinking that and looking at my rearview mirror and watching them all, bumper to bumper, and I thought, where's the reaping and sowing going into effect? I let everybody in. How come nobody's letting me in? Trivial things, but we can use them, though, to acclimate us to this idea of long-suffering. And if you say, I struggle with that, patience... Struggle with it. Struggle with long suffering. Struggle with patience. It's just hard on me. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons is to empower us to do things that we don't want to do. To forgive when we don't want to forgive. To, to look the other way when somebody's really irritating instead of looking at them and blowing on them, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Blowing your steam or whatever you call that. I don't know what I'm trying to say right now. Get mad at them. It's the Holy Spirit that says, no, 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 no. Just, 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 just put yourself in my hands. I got this. I can help you get through this. Love suffereth long. Number two, love is kind. These are in verse four. Love is kind. The word kind used here means to be adaptable or compliant to the needs of others. To be adaptable or compliant to the needs of others. If we love like God does, then we will not demand that others give us what we want. We will discern, we will look at others, discerning their need, and do what is necessary to meet their needs. That's what the word kind means. It means I'm not going to seek my own. I'm going to look at you and I'm going to figure out where is your weakness. I'm going to figure out where your need is. And I'm going to try to step up and step in and help you with the resources I have to help you. A good word. A kind deed. Helping people. It's the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite walked by on the other side. Levite walked by on the other side. Only thing to do with that. 
the, the Samaritan says, I see him and, and he has needs and I will do what it takes to get that man back up. Gets him out of the ditch, takes him to an inn, pays for his bandaging and fixes him up and, and for a place to stay. That's, kind, that's the kind of kindness that God, and love is kind. And that's what God means when He says kind. It is saying, when I get up today, look, um, Millie, uh, a lady came to the church the other day and was looking for help. Not really asking our church for the help, but was looking for help with something, and I'm not going to go all into it, but um, I, I came out of my office, walked down the hallway, saw her, stopped, greeted her, met her for the first time, and I uh, heard her asking, well, what is it you need? And it was something that I could help with. Now look, it was going to take, and it ended up taking 90 minutes of my time that day to, to help this lady with, this, with this, what she needed. But listen, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, come on now, get at it, and come on. You know you have the wherewithal to help her, and you need to help her. And as I listened, I was justifying my, in my mind why I shouldn't be the one that had to go help her. That's what we do. Try to figure a way out. The Holy Spirit's done, done tapped us on the shoulder. Now we're trying to figure out why we don't have to do it. In the end, I thankfully, I just yielded and gave up and said, look, I can help you with that. And she said, you're the pastor. You don't have to do that. And I said, that, that, that's the flimsiest reason for not doing it that I've ever heard of in my life. I don't think I said exactly that, but I just looked at her and said, no, no. I said, you have the ability, I have the time, and I have the, I'm sorry, you have a problem, I have the ability, I have the time to help you, I'll do it. And, and, and I'll grab my youth pastor and make him go, and make him do all the work. And it did take two of us, but. I, now look, and, and I'm not, look, I'm not, not. Not trying to lift me up. I'm just telling you of, of an illustration. It's not only just when uh, somebody's lost and you have the opportunity to witness to them. It's other things. And other, it's whatever need that they have. And when you cross their path, you have to seriously consider for a moment at least that maybe God had planned for you to help them because there you are in their presence and they have a need and you can help them. There's a good chance that God's saying, I put you there at that exact time. I didn't have to go outside of my office. Millie was not going to bring her to my office. But I left my office to do something and there we are. Divine appointments. Somebody has a need. Are we willing to step up? I hate to say that I miss, I miss times too. There are times that I blow right by it. There are times, but, 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 but we need to be more yielded to the Holy Spirit that we recognize this is, why, this is why I'm here today at this time, right now, meeting, talking to this person. It's to help them with that problem. Being kind is looking at the needs of others and trying to do whatever you can, what we can, to help them. And not saying, what about me? If you want to say, what about me? That's what you take to God. If you got to say that, then go to God and say, now what about me? I'm serving all these people. I'm meeting all these needs. And, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And, and look, and I want to do it. But I have struggles too. But I will tell you this. There is a secret to meeting somebody else's need. There's a secret to serving other people. There's a secret to being kind. And it is generally when you are meeting somebody else's needs and helping somebody else, your problems shrink. They just do. It, they, that's just the way that it is. You get done with them and you come back and maybe something was heavy on your heart and it's still there, but you think, it's not quite as heavy though as it was. Come, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, take my yoke upon you. God, He doesn't say, sit down or lay down, Jesus doesn't. He says, no, take my yoke upon you. And learn of me. Sir, get out there serving other people. Being kind. Being kind to other people. And he says, I will give you rest. Your burdens, look, your burden may still be there, but you're going to come back and look at it and go, we can deal with that. When you're pulling with Jesus, when you get into the yoke with Jesus, to help somebody else, 
then Jesus is still in that yoke with you and says, now we'll take care of your problem. Kind. Love is long-suffering. Love is kind. Jesus spent His entire life meeting the needs of everyone else around Him. Say amen if you believe that. Right. Right. I never really saw Him get flustered, really, except when somebody stood in His way of going to the cross. He had no patience with that. Remember Peter says, that's not going to happen to you. And he rebuked him se severely. And to all of the, those that preached, that preached, and all the Old, the Old Testament priests and everybody that, 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 that were in opposition to him and what he was trying to do, woe unto you, you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. He was hard on them. But everybody else... Jesus was long-suffering, and He was kind. He had a whole bunch of disciples following Him. And then He, he taught a certain doctrine. I don't have time to go into it, but most of them, the Bible said, most of them turned and walked away from Him. And these were people that He had healed. These were people that He had done great miracles for. And He preached something hard to them one day, and they said, we don't even understand that. And they turned and they left. And that's when Jesus looked at His twelve and said, will ye also go away? And Peter, what was Peter's great answer? Where are we going to go? You have the words of life. We can't find them anywhere else. We're not going anywhere. And Jesus didn't say this in the Bible, but I suspicion that He thought, and I know that and I'll turn the world upside down with you twelve men. Love suffereth long. It's long suffering. Love is kind. Love is kind. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. And I think I'm going to say this right, honey. Let me live for others that I might live for thee. That should be, that's a good motto to have every day. What are you going to do today? Well, I have some things planned, but I'm going to look out for others. I'm going to look out for people in need. And when I cross those paths, I'm going to yield to the Holy Spirit and say, help me to help those that you would help. Jesus, help me to help those that you were help, that you would help if you were in my shoes today. You know, in the devotions, I often in the devotion, glorify God with your life and do the works that He has given you to do today. What, are the, what am I talking about there? I'm talking about the works. I'm talking about the opportunities that God brings you across. Be sensitive to know there's one. I need to be kind. I need to think about somebody else. And number three, and this is the last one here. Number three for, for this morning. Love envieth not. The word envy here describes a person who is dedicated to his own desires and plans. That's what that means, that word envy. It's zealous, Z-E-L-O-S in the Greek. It, it means dedicated to his own desires and plans. He is so consumed with getting his own way that rarely is there anything that stands in the way of his self-centered focus. It's all about me. The narcissist. All about me. Oh, I have no problem with you, but I'll, deal, I'll help you later. I got something that's me. That's me. Can't you see my life is about me and where I'm going and what I need to do? Love envieth not. God says, my love that I, that, that I want you to love one another with doesn't act that way. It doesn't act that way. The people may seem ambitious that are this way, but in the end, their only concern is the accomplishing and possessing of all their desires. I want what, what desires I have in my heart. Now that's okay if your desire is to serve Him. And if your desire is to be long-suffering. And if your desire is to be kind, then chase that desire all day long. But you know what I'm saying here. I'm talking about the person that just says, I don't have time. I don't have time from other people. I, 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 I got to get this. I want this. I got to accomplish this. I need to possess this. 
preachers have to be very careful about this. It's easy for us to look around at other churches. I think I told you, I talked to a guy, pastors a church about an hour from here, not long ago. And I said, I wish I hadn't asked him. I said, how's your church doing during COVID? Man, we had 10 families join in the last quarter and our offerings are way up. And I said, hey, okay, goodbye. <laughs> I was joking. And he understood. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm kidding. I said, I'm really, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I do. I want to hear, I want to hear that, you know. And look, we have things happening here too. Two people were saved last Thursday night, two, you know, three days ago, Thursday night. One of our teens, I think I already mentioned that earlier, but in, in a, a young adult. And uh, people are getting baptized and people are joining here too. And this guy pastors a big church, big church. But pastors have to be careful with that. Because you, you, you can look at somebody else's church and say, I wish I had that opportunity. And I'm going to be honest with you, I, and I mean this, I mean this, I don't wish that. Because I have a sneaky suspicion that they got problems too. Anywhere you get a group of people together, you have problems. You know why? Because we all, we got problems. I have problems. And let me be careful. I don't want to send you out of here thinking, oh my goodness, the pastor said we got problems. <laughs> well, not every church has problems. Broken people, you know, have, have a tough time fitting together perfectly. It's just the way we are. Starting right here. So, uh, we don't, have, we don't have problems really in our church like other churches that have real deep-seated problems. We don't have that. We don't have that. But I have heard of other preachers who say, well, if I just could get such and such or get... No, no, don't envy something else. Be happy with what you have. And, and dedicate yourself to the work of God that He wants to do through you where you're at. Bloom where you're planted. And the blooming while you're planted is to not envy. And, and, and I really spoke a little bit about envy as it's not described here. But, but uh, not wanting everything that you have to have and sacrificing Conclusion. A Bible theologian by the name of Rick Renner, and he's an authority on the Greek language, wrote this summary of the verses, or, or, or of these three words. He said, he said, if we were to just you know, write it out and kind of paraphrase it, this is what I would write. Love passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. Love doesn't demand that others be like itself, but is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to be what others need it to be. Love is not ambitious, self-centered, or, self or so consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs of others or desires of others. He said, in my expertise in the Greek language, that's the way I would paraphrase those three words. Long-suffering, kind, and envieth not. How are we doing today? How are you doing? How am I doing in the mirror of God's Word? Has it explained? What kind of love do you possess? Is it long-suffering? Is it kind? Above all, is it kind? Does it envy? Or is it like God's love? I'm always going to be. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee going to be there and I'm going to meet your needs and I'm going to be patient and God says I'm going to devote myself to these 7 billion people on the earth most of them trying to call them into my presence to have them come home to me through, for salvation and for those believers I'm there for you to help you to empower you to get through this life, to reward you now and at the end, as we talked about on Wednesday, the crown of life and four other crowns that the Bible mentions. God is all about us. And God says, that's the way I want you to treat each other. 
I want you to be all about each other. Forget about yourself. Give yourself for one another. Many marriages can be strengthened through this truth. Many friendships can be saved through this truth. Many churches can experience the greatest unity they've ever experienced through love, through God's love, through agape love. Many communities can get a clearer picture of who God really is and maybe, just maybe consider turning to the Lord because of what they see in you and in us. What can we do to possess the agape love? Learn of the Holy Spirit and His desire to empower us. Lean on Him. Yield to Him. When you feel that welling of anger coming up, pray and say, Holy Spirit, I need you really bad right now to help that help us to keep this tamp down. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm there. I'm there. I'm in that yoke. Holy Spirit. Yielding to the Holy Spirit. We'll continue on with these uh, for the next several weeks. Let's pray. Without looking around uh, everybody in an attitude of prayer, if you are in this room today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, then you have no hope of loving with an agape love. You don't, because that love comes from God and is lived out through you, through the Holy Spirit that indwells you. If you're without Christ this morning, do not wait another day to establish that personal relationship with Him. And as I say, I'll say again, if you say, well, most people think I'm saved, and you know, it's going to be embarrassing. I don't, look, it doesn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't. That's a trivial, that's a trivial detail when you think about you're dangling your soul over eternal separation and torment when you put off the decision to accept Christ. If you're here today and you say, that's, that's me, or at best, I don't know if I'm saved. I mean, I might be, but I'm not sure. If you say, Pastor, I'd like for you to pray for me now. I need to receive Christ, or, uh, or, or I need some type of assurance of it. If you're that way and raise your hand, I'd like to pray for you at this point. Anybody like that here this morning? Okay, let's pray. Father, I pray You would bless our, uh, bless our invitation. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll just, uh, you'll just hammer away at us in our crusty edges and our, our, uh, the chill in our hearts sometimes. And I pray that You'll help us to warm up to Your ways. I pray that You'll help us to warm up to love and to love You and one another with agape love, a powerful love that focuses on everybody else and is long-suffering, kind and in the not. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you'll stand at this time, please, in an attitude of prayer. You stand where you're at. We're going to play a couple stanzas of our invitation. And uh, if, if you have any need at all that I can help you with, this is a good time to come down. Or if you just need to come down yourself to the altar to pray, then uh, the altar is open. without Christ, don't wait another day. Just do what I did on November 4th, 1979, 42 years ago. Just walk out of your seat and come down. And if this is too much pressure for you, see me after the service. Just say, I'm without Christ. See me after the service. We don't want you to leave this building without having that assurance.
Thank you. If I could have your attention, please. I want to share something with you that uh, uh, Martha Chalkley has allowed me to talk about. You know, she's had her battles and, uh, and battles with cancer. And, and she's been going through one recently. I mean, like the last year, uh, the last year, I think I can say, yeah. And, uh, and we've been praying and praying and praying and praying that God would give her the victory. And look, it, I mean, it was more than a scare. I mean, it was, this was serious. And she got a report the other day, and I'm probably not going to get it right, but the, the, there, was some, there was a test that they did, and anything under 37, whatever the measurement of 37 is, anything under 37 is good. And her, and her work, her test came back at 6.7. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. So she came forward today to praise God. Amen. To praise God. I mean, you know, that's, that's, another, that's another reason to, to come forward. You know, without uh, just... And, uh, and I was so glad she told me this on Thursday? Friday. She told me this. Her and Clyde drove by and told me this on Friday. And, uh, and I was so excited. We were all just so excited. And I asked her then, can I share this? May I share this with the church? And she said, absolutely. And you know, that's a good thing. We always, we always hear about the needs, and, and, and rightly so. But we also can't forget to praise Him and lift Him up when He has done great things for us. And uh, so we're thankful for that. And I'm thankful for uh, Clyde and Martha. And it's so good to see you back, Martha, uh, back in our services. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you for coming, uh, coming today. Visitors, so glad to have you with us. Again, and I pray that God has met your need. I really do. I pray the Holy Spirit has met your need and comforted and challenged you, uh, particularly in the area of love. How does your love measure up to God's love? And uh, let's learn from this, from this series that we're in. All right, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we will be dismissed. Father, thank you for the victories. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful, miraculous victory in Martha's life. Thank you for delivering her from the cancer. And Lord, and we know that, that uh, that's not always your will. But it was in this case, and it was an answer to our prayers. And we're just so thankful, and just you're so gracious, and you love us so, and I don't know why. You love us so deeply and so strongly. It's past understanding. Thank you for our church family that's gathered again this morning. 
to come in and to encourage one another and to be encouraged by each other and through the music and through the message. And I pray that's happened. Holy Spirit, change us now as we look at the, the love of God, the agape love that God possesses and that He challenges us. Help us to take the challenge, and to grab the baton and to run with it. And to run with it and love people as God loves people. And we love you and we thank you for uh, this time together this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.